Okay, well, I told you yesterday, I started my obsession with wanting to study ketogenic diets in grad school in the 90s, and I was in an exercise science lab, and I made the fatal mistake of actually reading Steve's studies, and, and Tim, your, your studies as well, the Lambert study, which were the two key high-fat diet studies, and, uh, and I read them 100 times and highlighted every line in those articles and shared them with all my peers and my... my my professors and um, begged my advisor to let me study this, <laughs> and they thought I was crazy. But after you know begging for three years, they let me start a study in this area. Uh, so, uh, so that was my um, my mistake is is actually believing those studies had some merit. Uh, but uh, in many ways, um, it took me a while to actually study uh, exercise uh, related a aspects of ketogenic diets because I got more interested in cholesterol metabolism. But uh, the FASTER study was was one effort to really uh, validate uh, you know Steve and Tim's work and, and extend it in some ways in terms of the metabolic adaptation. So this was a study that I did it right before I left University of Connecticut to come to Ohio State. And it was, in many ways, a, a rather straightforward study. It was a cross-sectional uh, study in elite athletes. And we had the, the goal of just trying to convince uh, what at the time were, were a, a growing group of high-caliber ultra-endurance athletes that had switched to a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Okay, what am I doing wrong here? Other... Wrong remote. <laughs> okay. Laser, okay. Um, so we published some of this work. We actually have a, a lot of work we haven't published. So uh, I, uh, I, w I w might share some of that with you in time, but um, uh, a shout out to some of my doctoral students. We need to get the papers on here. <laughs> Dr. Signs. <laughs> Uh, we have some really fantastic data, but we did publish the primary metabolic data, and, and we were successful. This was probably the most surprising part of the study was how easy it was to convince people to fly to our lab at the University of Connecticut and go through some very invasive procedures, uh, inject isotopes into them, cut into their legs, and extract muscle tissue. We were collecting urine and feces and saliva, everything we could get out of these guys, and they left thanking us, honestly. Like, they were so happy to participate. So just a tremendous group uh, of athletes. So we got 20 total, uh, nice symmetry here, 10 and 10. Um, so we had 10 very uh, uh, high-level ultra athletes that had been on a low-carb diet for at least uh, a year, but the average was closer to 20 months. So that's kind of important. So we're studying long-term chronic keto adaptation, and then we had the, the control high-carbohydrate athletes, and it turned out they were very well matched. Same physical characteristics, uh, even the same VO2 max. So really the primary difference here uh, is diet, and you can see the macro uh, distributions there. These were, these were pretty low carb, 10 to 12% carbohydrate for 20 months. So this is just a picture. They, uh, you know, the primary protocol we, we had them go through was a three-hour run on the treadmill, and they literally stared at a, a brick wall that had white bricks on it. <laughs> uh, and, and this is you know, a warm-up for many of these guys that are running 100-mile races uh, and other types of ultra-endurance events. So that, that's not as brutal as it sounds to, uh, to probably most of you. Uh, and then we had them go through... Uh, variety of different uh, uh, procedures, including muscle biopsies and blood draws, et cetera. So the, the, one of the primary uh, outcomes of this study was just documenting their peak fat burning. And as Tim mentioned um, earlier, uh, these were extraordinary rates of fat oxidation. So literally twofold higher rates. And the fat oxidation in the high carb athletes is actually very high, 0.7 grams per minute. Uh, these are exceptionally good fat burners uh, and exceptionally good athletes, but we literally doubled that um, with the adoption of a low-carb diet. And prior to that, no one had really ever shown a fat oxidation of that level. If you look throughout the literature, again, 0.7 is pretty high, and if you look at individual 
values in some of the studies that have been out there, you see a few people get up close to one gram per minute. So we literally shattered the fat burning ceiling here. Uh, by documenting this in these athletes. And it occurs over a wide range of exercise intensities. So this is sort of a classic curve you get uh, as you go from low to moderate intensity exercise. You see a pretty linear increase in fat oxidation and then it drops off pretty fast as you increase exercise intensity. But everything's moved far up to, uh, far up and to the right when you're keto adapted. So you can burn more fat at any given exercise intensity and you can burn more fat at higher exercise intensities. And Tim showed you this graph. So you're deriving the majority of your energy from fat during three hours of submaximal exercise. Uh, and it would have been int really interesting to carry these guys out another three hours. Uh, and I think you really start to see um, and distinguish um, the, the benefits of, of being keto adapted because you're just much less dependent on carbs. Uh, and you see the key, ketones here, so uh, you do get this classic uh, post-exercise ketosis or Cortis Douglas effect as it's referred to, uh, but uh, not surprising, their ketones are higher. Measures of lipolysis, uh, this is serum glycerol, uh, not surprising. They're breaking down fat at a higher rate, so at least part of that substrate to support the higher fat oxidation is coming from adipose tissue, triglyceride lipolysis. Uh, but perhaps uh, m most surprising, I mean, if not bizarre, um, and, and, and probably the most important non-significant result I've ever reported, um, is that glycogen was completely the same between the high-carb athletes and the low-carb athletes, despite the fact they consumed very little carbohydrate. Uh, at rest, they're the same, and, and, and they did break down glycogen after the three hours of exercise, um, and even resynthesized glycogen over two hours of recovery, which is absolutely astonishing um, in the face of very little uh, carbohydrate intake. And we're still um, kind of scratching our heads wondering what's going on here. And if you actually calculate the amount of carbohydrate they oxidized during exercise, it's about 100 grams less than what th this glycogen depletion shows. So the obvious question is where did that glucose that w was broken down from glycogen go? And why would they even do this if they're, if they're burning fat at such a high rate? And did the, the short answer is we don't know. Um, I mean, we have a couple working hypotheses. One is, uh, you know, for, for those of you who studied metabolism, um, in the textbooks you'll read that fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate, which makes no sense. Um, but biochemically, it's derived from this thought that in order to keep the Krebs cycle running, you have to maintain a source of oxaloacetate, and that that's how you burn fat. And oxaloacetate is derived from glycolysis or glucose. So one thought is breaking down glycogen during exercise provides a source of glucose to make pyruvate, which can be converted to oxaloacetate and keeps that Krebs cycle running so you can burn fat. But that glucose is not terminally oxidized and doesn't show up in indirect calorimetry type measurements. The second thought is, um, is that you, know, you need a source of glucose, not for glycolysis, but for the pentose phosphate pathway, which does operate sort of in parallel to glycolysis and produces five carbon uh, sugars and is also a source of uh, reducing equivalents. Uh, which is important for uh, various reactions that might be beneficial uh, for recovery uh, or for energy metabolism. But uh, what I do think this shows is that when you're chronically keto adapted, because this wasn't shown by Steve after four weeks, um, is the body conserves carbon sources within the glycogen uh, and glucose uh, and lactate sort of interconversions uh, very efficiently. So it's very likely this carbons that are, are used here to synthesize glycogen are coming perhaps from lactate, uh, or that's either directly a source for glycogen synthesis or going to the liver, being converted to glucose, and then coming back as a source for glycogen synthesis. That's the Cori cycle. 
any rate, there's a lot of interesting work that needs to be followed up on here in terms of describing that and validating that. I just thought I'd show you quick, this hasn't been published, it, it, this paper is in review, but uh, these very healthy, highly insulin sensitive, keto adapted athletes that are performing really well have super high cholesterol levels, uh, at, at, almost all of them. You can see here the uh, almost uh, twofold higher LDL cholesterol levels. Every one of them should be on a statin, right? Um, but look at the HDL cholesterols. I, I mean, I've done cholesterol levels on thousands and thousands of people, and, and I've rarely seen people over 100 milligrams per deciliter, and we've got uh, half, the, half that cohort uh, over that level. So when you look at the LDL to cholesterol ratio or total cholesterol to HDL ratio, it's actually the same. Uh, in these two groups. And we look at particle uh, distribution uh, by NMR, despite having uh, almost twice the concentration of LDL cholesterol, they have fewer small LDL cholesterols. And we heard about this from Ron yesterday. Um, and this, this is actually consistent with a, a, a lot of the work that I did uh, initially on keto, keto, uh, ketosis and, uh, and lipoprotein changes. Uh, so all the increase in LDL cholesterols in the larger, more buoyant particles, which Ron said yesterday, were, were okay. They don't contribute to increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and we've, we've obtained a lot of other uh, interesting data from this study, from the muscle biopsies. Uh, we've done uh, full transcriptomic uh, analysis and gene expression and metabolomic analysis and fatty acid composition in the muscle, and it, everything looks great. I mean, these, it all supports the greater fat oxidation. Their phospholipid membranes are, are, have higher levels of unsaturated fat and they're more fluid and less saturated fat, which is consistent with improved health. Uh, there's just a lot of other interesting things we're, we're still yet to, uh, to publish. Uh, but but this, um, this was a cross-sectional study and I think limitations in cross-sectional studies is you don't know, you can't deal with the self-selection and whether or not you know uh, these, these people uh, that are keto adapted or chose to keto adapt have some unique feature about them that lets them be successful. Uh, so prospective studies are always nice to look at um, changes over time. And so we, um, we, we decided to, to do a, a well-controlled prospective study and, and we've had a strong interest in how we can enhance soldier health. So we had a very strong military relevance to this type of study. And uh, you know, the military has the same problems as the rest of the population. This is a recent, white paper that came out showing that um, in uh, young adults, 17 to 24 years old, 71% uh, of them are actually ineligible to join the military, uh, even if they wanted to. And the primary reason is because of health problems, mainly obesity. So, um, so we just finished data collection, and this was a big study in my lab last year in terms of consuming a lot of our time and effort. Uh, Rich LaFountain and Vin Miller were um, the primary uh, lead on, on this project, but uh, Taryn Sapper, head of my dietetic team, ran all the, the dietary uh, intervention aspect of this and everyone contributed. But it was a 12-week intervention. Um, we provided a lot of the food uh, to the participants and uh, the, the subject population was primarily Army ROTC cadets on campus. Uh, as well as others with military affiliations. Uh, we had a control group too. We trained all these groups, supervised training, um, and we had a, you know, a, a, a very uh, well-formulated ketogenic diet we wanted to implement, and we were very um, aggressive in maintaining ketosis. We had them check their ketones every day um, and adjust the diet if necessary, and I, I think this is one of the more important findings, just the fact that we can uh, keep these relatively young men, and we had a couple women in the study as well, uh, in ketosis um, demonstrates feasibility of this in a relatively you know, college-age population, because the military doesn't think this is feasible, at least a lot of the people I talked to, but we had an average ketone of over one millimolar um, and, a, and very good compliance across all the subjects. So they were in ketosis. And this is the results in uh, weight loss. Uh, and this was not a weight loss intervention. We specifically did not uh, prescribe a caloric level. Uh, we wanted people to be in ketosis and we wanted them to be happy. So we fed them as the most palatable and satisfying diet we could. Those were the two main goals of the diet. 
Um, so this is a spontaneous reduction in calories as a real result of being in ketosis. And you, it's really quite dramatic how this played out. You can see every single person lost weight. And again, this was not a weight loss study um, compared to uh, you know, virtually no change in the, in the control group. And they lost body fat. We did DEXA, we did MRIs to look at visceral fat and liver fat, and everything's looking better. So there's just, and we've, we've had a, a indication this is the case, uh, with, especially with training, is you see rather transformative changes in body composition, uh, especially when you add resistance training to the ketogenic diet. And I don't, don't have all the data here, but their performance um, w uh, and their adaptation to the training uh, more or less mirrored that of the high carb group. So they're losing weight, but still getting stronger and adapting to the training in terms of a lot of measures of physical function, uh, strength, power, uh, endurance, uh, and even cognition data we have. And we have muscle biopsy data from this. Uh, Vin Miller had a poster yesterday looking at a lot of mitochondrial adaptations. Um, and Rich LaFountain had a poster on cardiac adaptations from MRI, and we're seeing positive adaptations uh, in those particular aspects of physiology. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here in terms of uh, why an athlete might consider a low carb, high fat, ketogenic type diet. Um, and it goes beyond just enhancing fat oxidation. That's a big fundamental part of why you would consider it. But a lot of what we heard about earlier on ketones being signaling molecules and creating an environment of less oxidative stress, less inflammation, uh, all sort of ties into the ability to recover and adapt to training at a higher level. And the long-term view of an athlete, those are big factors to consider. It's not just about acute uh, performance and doing anything you can to enhance performance metabolically by carb loading and, and enhancing availability of glucose, that's sort of short-term gain, long-term loss in terms of a lot of the uh, toxic byproducts of burning carbs all the time. So um, this is what we hear from a lot of the low-carb, high-fat athletes. They, they're bonk-proof, they recover faster, they enjoy exercise more, they have less need to fuel during exercise. All these factors, I think, you know, you've got to consider if, if you're working with an athlete or considering this yourself. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, choosing which diet to follow.